Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Bridge. Today I've got a guest who uh, I'm really amazed that I've never interviewed in person before. It's a Shashang single of Coda. Now Coda was, you'd call it one of the success stories of BSV. They won the Bitcoin Association Hackathon back in Seoul in 2019. Uh, they did a deal with Tal in 2020 and things have been going pretty well since then. They've launched their API marketplace and um, yeah, I'm talking to Shashank about uh, what their plans are for the future, how it's all going, why Coder exists, and uh, how it can actually make some money for the developers who use it. Shashank, welcome to the Bitcoin Bridge. Thanks for coming on the show. It's good to finally uh, meet you at last. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, John. Yeah, we've, we've exchanged emails and messages back and forth uh, for quite some time now, but it's definitely nice to speak to you properly. We have, yeah, you're, uh, you're coming to us from Sydney. So, Sydney, uh, Australia, that's right. How's things over there? Uh, well, we're currently in lockdown. Uh, it's been uh, two months now, two and a half months of sort wow. of a hard lockdown. Um, so that's not great. But uh, look, yeah, in the next month or two, we're looking to open up. So looking forward to that. Uh, and definitely had some extra time to, to sit down and work, which has been good. Tell me what's the, I've never asked this of anyone before, but uh, what's the first thing you're going to do when you're allowed to go outside again? Well, honestly, well, actually, uh, I've managed to get a travel exemption to fly to New York for the for the CoinGeek conference. Mm -hmm. So that'll be the first time I'm allowed to get outside again. So, so I suppose ex explore the, the wonders of New York <laughs> will be the first thing. Awesome. Yeah. Have you been there before? No, I, I never have, actually. So I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. I think you'll enjoy it. All right. Let's talk about Coda. Now, uh, you guys have had a, a pretty pretty momentous time over the last couple of years. I, uh, I saw you collect the first prize in the Bitcoin Association Hackathon back in Seoul, which I think was the last time I actually left the country. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, a, um, that was a good event and uh, you guys took the prize. So um, I know you've made leaps and bounds since then. Tell us, well, I guess for, for people who don't know, tell us you know, what Coda is. You know, let's hear it from you, and um, yeah, tell us tell us about the journey from hackathon to launched product. Yes, of course. Um, so Coda is essentially an API marketplace. Mm -hmm. So what that is, it's uh, a place where developers can uh, exchange sort of their code and their APIs uh, and pay each other uh, per call in BSV for each time they they call each other's APIs and are allowed to use each other's programs and code. Right. Uh, so it was born, as you mentioned, out of the, the Bitcoin Association Hackathon uh, in Seoul. Uh, and we came up with the idea during, during a, um, me and my co-founder came up with the idea during a 48 hour hackathon. Back then they were, they were much shorter than they are nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, and once we built it, we, we thought, well, this is amazing, right? This is a, a real revolutionary product that people will use. Uh, and luckily we managed to fly to Seoul and, and pitch it to the judges and, and the, the judges in the crowd seemed to, seemed to agree with us. Uh, and we managed to take home the prize. Um, so in terms of our journey since then, uh, we've just been, we've been trying to build out the product. So obviously, when you when you build for a hackathon, it's a forty eight hour project. So it's not it, you, know, it's, you can't push it out live, right? There's no sort of security infrastructure behind it. There's no um, you know there, there's you have barely any features. So we spent a long time sort of building out our features, building out our security, uh, building out our speed, right? So how how APIs work in essence is it's a, a call across across the internet or across um, HTTP, uh, usually to um, to another program. And Coda reroutes the call through a Coda gateway. Right. So it goes through Coda and then we will authenticate your user. We can bill them and we can make sure that the call is coming through securely and is not screwing with your application anyway. And we send it through. Uh, and what that does is it means that we, you know, we have to focus on speed and efficiency as much as possible. <clears throat> uh, so we spent a lot of focus on that and we've done multiple sort of stress tests and build tests to ensure that we have the best and fastest product possible. Uh, but yeah, so essentially the, the, what we've, what we've done recently now is we've launched the product publicly, uh, and sort of what, what our aim is, is we want API developers all over the world to know that they can just do what they do best, right? They can write code. And then we handle absolutely everything else, right? So we'll market their API on our platform. We'll handle their authentication and user management. We'll handle their analytics. We'll handle their billing and they'll get paid in real time immediately in BSV whenever someone tries to consume their product. Mm -hmm. And um, 
what uh, what has the level of interest been like from the developer community? I mean, has there been any sort of hesitance to get involved because it's BSV or, uh, you know, have people been just jumping in? Certainly lots. So we actually sort of have an attitude from since the beginning that, you know, we're not a BSV product, right? right. We're a product that uses BSV to, to achieve a goal. Uh, that that is difficult to achieve otherwise. So our marketing has always been more towards all developers rather than just BSV developers. And that means that we've encountered a lot of friction. So other developers will be like, you know, we love your product, we love your idea, but we firstly don't know what BSV is. We don't care what it is. We don't want to have to deal with an exchange to, to buy BSV, then put it on the platform and then try to use it. If we make money here, we don't want to, have to again go to an exchange uh, and and cash it out and figure out all the all the things about it. Certainly, we've also heard hate, right? Like people who just dislike BSV, know yeah. BSV and dislike it. Uh, so we've encountered a lot of friction on those fronts, uh, and we have certainly have plans in the in the very near future to overcome that. Um, but within the BSV community itself, and within certain software developers who are comfortable overcoming that friction, uh, we've had a lot of support and a lot of love, which has been really good. Yeah, that's. It's kind of a dilemma I find often, you know, working in the BSV industry too, is like you've, hmm. you've got this thing, you know it works well, you know it works better than anything else out there, but either they're they're not blockchain people and don't want to be one, or, you know, they're hardcore BTC people and they're not interested in anything that's <laughs> not BTC. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I still haven't quite settled on what the best message is for those people other than, you know, like, here it is. Try it and see. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess like the at the end of the day, I mean, if they're sort of hardcore BTC people and they hate anything different, then you can't really you can't really change them, right? They'll have to yeah. learn that over time. Honestly, no. But it's yeah. In terms of the other side of the coin, where it's people who aren't blockchain people and don't want to become it, I think that's fair, right? All they want is they want a product that they can jump into, they can connect to easily, and they can use easily, right? They don't want to have to take ten other steps, and I think that's reasonable. Um, so certainly we're, we're sort of trying to build a product around them rather than trying to, to convince them <laughs> about the product uh, and, and how to work around the, the nitty gritty. It's uh, similar to the early days of Bitcoin, you know, when, when we were BTC and you had to, people weren't convinced, but uh, if you could just whip out a wallet, show them a transaction, get them to actually do it, that, that little demonstration seemed to convert more people than talking about mm -hmm. it. You, know, you could talk yeah, about exactly. it all day and it wasn't until yeah. they tried it they said "Ooh." <laughs> yeah that's yeah they just need to see that it's easy right see that's something that they can use easily and then they'll be happy right then they'll use it for, for the vast majority of people that's the case exactly yeah so it's um we're talking about that for a reason because it's the uh, the capacity for microtransactions nanotransactions that kind of thing that makes coda possible um could you tell us, uh, like, what what already exists, you know, in that in that arena? You know, what do you have any competitors or uh, any similar API marketplaces, things like that? Yeah, so there are API marketplaces that have existed for quite some time since sort of the API revolution in yeah. the early two thousand and tens. But most of them rely on sort of legacy systems, uh, and they use uh, sort of monthly monthly payment subscriptions. So you know, maybe you can pay you know, $30, $40 a month to subscribe to an API. Uh, and that obviously is is a lot of friction for a developer who's starting up, right? Like, do I really want to commit to $30, $40 worth of calls just to exactly. get, you know, the $5 of value that I'll be realistically extracting? Uh, so it's, it's, and also then if they sort of have, if, if API developers provide a free tier, then suddenly they just get leached, right? Everyone just creates new accounts and they use the free tier as much as they can yeah. instead of trying to pay the $30, $40. So I think Guilty. this way it's a nice middle ground that Coda is sort of trying to change where um, it's easy to experiment. You know, you're paying half a cent a tenth of a cent per call, right? And you're paying essentially nothing to use someone's API. Uh, and then that person will still profit in the long term, even if just a few people are playing around, they'll still be making money with it. Uh, and obviously the more people develop integrations with it, the more money they'll make is similarly to the subscription model. Uh, so it's, it's a win-win all around, I think. Yeah, I remember you saying in the past that it was, it was based on the lifestyle of, you know, developers who might be working for a corporation or working on someone else's project for their salary. But, you know, their coding is their passion. They're working on it in their spare time and they can't really make any money out of that easily. Hmm. So is, is that your experience, yours and Andrew's? Certainly, yeah. So it's 
it's really difficult to monetize like as if you're just a developer right and many developers so some developers like to wear other hats too but many developers just they just like to sit down and code yeah right and for, for them it's really hard to actually build money around their code right have earn money from their code so they've built amazing applications fantastic applications unique people love them people can come in uh and and use them but they like they just don't know how to attract users firstly they don't know how to market it they have to build massive sort of user account systems analytic systems they have to manage uh security make sure that no one's sort of attacking their their api or ddosing them uh and it and, and from what we've heard it actually ends up taking almost twice as long usually to build the entire account management system and analytics system and everything around the API than yeah. it does to build the software itself. Right. So that's sort of insane, right? Like it, instead of build, you can build three different amazing APIs then in the time that it would take to build one and then build a system around it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we want is we, we want them to be able to build their three APIs and, and profit much more from that. I never really thought about it that way. Yeah, I was thinking more mm. about having to you know, build, write an API versus building the whole application. I'm not a developer, so I don't really know how people approach these things. You know, do people ever yeah. set out to build a whole app by themselves in their bedroom, or is it? Uh, you know, do they usually work on things like APIs first? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, it depends uh, on what the person's doing, but certainly, like it, as a as sort of a backend developer, you would love to just build an API, right? Mm -hmm. and that's super, that's as a backend developer, right? That's your bed, bread and butter, right? You, you can you can sit down and do that quite easily. Uh, but then building sort of an entire front end, and a, pay, a, a website for people to come to and then somehow marketing it so people will know about it, it, it becomes absurd and completely beyond um, in order, like a skill set that the normal API developer will have and also beyond what they want to do, you know, what they enjoy doing. Um, so we want to keep them in line with their passions and keep them benefiting as best as they can very cool yeah so you uh, you talked about the api revolution before of the uh, the 2010s hmm. oh, okay this is a dumb question because i'm not a dev no, and I'm, I'm assuming no most, <laughs> most of the uh, audience isn't either but to, what was that i mean i know what an I, api is but what was the api revolution and why did it happen at that point yeah so so like in the early stages of the internet right people would just build their own applications everything that they built they would build themselves from scratch, they, they sometimes you can pull some bits of things from you know Bootstrap or CSS. You can pull some things to help you out, uh, but essentially they would build entire applications, websites, everything themselves. What people realized in in sort of the late 2000s and early 2010s is that well, a lot of other people, you know, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of other people have done this work already. So why yeah. are we all just doing doing work that other people have done? So instead, people started building APIs that other people could connect to, and right. that way instead of doing a whole bunch of work yourself, you can just find a bunch of APIs where people have done the work for you and connect them into your own application and you can get up and running much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially what the API revolution was when people discovered that it was much easier to, 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 to do that and work together, harmonize uh, and build applications faster and more effectively uh, than you could by yourself. I'm just taking a look at the uh, Coda API marketplace as it exists mm. now. now you, uh, you launched, I think in June or July? this year uh yes yes so it was early august this year hmm. right so from from hackathon to launched product it was probably about oh not quite two years would hmm. you um for other hackathon entrants would you consider that you know a pretty reasonable time is it faster or less than average or were you cautious what happened yeah i think it depends what you're building uh, hmm. and also what challenges you face along the way right so Certainly for some products, you can you can get them up and running much, much faster. Uh, but we had a big focus on security. And also recently, uh, since we launched our private beta uh, in sort of July last of last year, uh, we were collecting a lot of user feedback, ensuring we had built the best product and then focusing on compliance. So as I mentioned, um, we have an intention to, uh, in the near future, Make the make the platform much more accessible to non BSV users. Right. So people from the wider developer community can come in and they can they can use BSV without even knowing it essentially, right? Maybe maybe the, like we'll tell them that we'll tell them it's running under the hood, but they don't need to interact with it. They don't need to buy it. They don't need to sell it. They can pay in fiat. They can receive money in fiat, and they can withdraw and deposit in a smooth manner. So, yeah, but to do that, you need uh, you you face a lot of compliance issues. And also when you're building remittance services uh, for people to pay each other in BSV, especially in a, as an Australian business, 
you face a lot of compliance issues. So we spent a long time um, dealing with those compliance issues, getting the right registrations, working with the right authorities and Australian regulatory bodies, and also building the right um, KYC and KYT services uh, to go alongside our product and make sure that we were fully compliant um, based on global standards. How's that been? Are they Have they been very open to the idea or has anyone you know, sort of stalled you or thrown up any extra hurdles or anything like that? In terms of uh, regulatory bodies? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's been a lot of hurdles, to be honest. Uh, the, especially in Australia, the um, the regulatory system, particularly around cryptocurrency, is is, is quite, and, and any emerging technology really is quite archaic. So it takes a long time to navigate through the systems and they're um, sort of what they ask of businesses when it comes to these regulations are, are very, it's a very high standard that they ask. You know, you need to, you, you know, you need to be very, very sure that every transaction running through your system has no element of fraud and every single customer who's coming through your system is is, is identified and you, and as has no affiliations in any way, shape or form with anything mm-hmm. uh, at all below board. So um, it is a very, very high standard. So it has been extremely difficult. Uh, but we, yeah, we managed to get it done. <laughs> Do they have like a money transmitter laws in Australia? Do you have to register as a, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we um, we have registrations as a remittance service provider and as a digital exchange provider in right. Australia. Um, and when you, you know, when you register with your services, you also need to have sort of programs in place. That means you reach a certain level, a certain standard of reporting to the government uh, based on any sort of risky or illicit transactions that happen on your system. Mm-hmm. I see. Right. Okay. Well, I'm just, uh, yeah, again, taking a look at the, some of the examples you've got, uh, you've got COVID-19 data from Johns Hopkins and the WHO, CDC stock market Mm. and crypto quotes. I'm guessing that second one is probably the most popular one that you're using at the moment. Would that be right? Certainly. I mean, yeah, we've, we've had some, we've had a lot of interesting APIs and, um, we're really excited to see like, even in the future, sort of what's, what's constantly being listed. Um, so while we have some interesting APIs on right now, a lot of uh, a lot of developers have sort of listed private APIs, meaning that they're not public on the marketplace, uh, okay. but they can sort of send links and, and publicize them to, to people who they want to see. Um, that way they can handle sort of the, the distribution and authentication system uh, without necessarily dealing with publicly posting in the marketplace. Right. Uh, and there are some really, really interesting APIs and we're looking forward to when they are publicly posted. Um, sort of what that what that means for the ecosystem and 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 how much people love them it's uh, it's actually funny i i only see one identifiable bsv business on there and that's a veritas yeah yeah Very... as i mentioned yeah we like i said our messaging has largely been towards non-bsv uh, mm-hmm. developers and it's a, it's a big effort it's a big push to attract them to the system rather than uh, focus on bsv developers yeah, probably a good idea, to be honest. I think uh, you've, you've got to try and... It's a much bigger market, to be sure. Yeah, to reach as many people as possible. I mean, a lot of these a lot of these BSP projects, you know, I see they're, mm. they're very worthy and everything, but uh, the audience is really other BSP projects, and you can pretty much guess who's going to jump on board and use it. So yeah, it's good yeah, to so see we, yeah, branching out. We put out. a lot of effort into trying to expand that, and hopefully, uh, if, you know, if we pave the way, other people can, can use can get more used to BSV as they sort of can use the platform easily. Uh, and then hopefully that'll mean that other BSV businesses benefit as well. So, yeah. All <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about the future then. I mean, you're, you're an API marketplace. Do you, um, do you have any plans to go beyond APIs? Like maybe just uh, code libraries in general or anything? Certainly. So um, yeah, like, yes, we run an API marketplace, but we, we see sort of our, main strength technologically speaking to be our uh, payment processing gateway right so i'm talking about right. uh, the, the the thing that i described earlier that reroutes api calls uh and that essentially authenticates bills and uh and and secures any transaction uh that happens through an api uh, uh to the to the end user uh and obviously with some modification you can sort of spin this out into a bunch of other microtransaction themed services so a, so a gateway can process sort of transactions to do with data storage right you can have uh you can have data storage you can pay per per hour per kilobyte for example Mm -hmm. uh for for your cloud storage um you can have compute services that you can pay per hash uh for any functions that you want someone to perform for you uh you can have sort of internet of things uh gateways that manage different devices and you can even have billing between devices if you want to rent out your internet of things device uh, to to someone else for a first period of time, they can pay you in real time in microtransactions for the exact amount of minutes that they use. Right? There's there's a 
there's a bundle of use cases that we have on our roadmap um, that are really, really powerful and really interesting. Yeah, I guess it's all, it concerns like all the different way people might use pieces of software, you know, like not, not just API calls, but, you know, like other things per hour, storage, that kind of thing. There's all different sorts of services you could offer. Exactly. It's just microtransactions, essentially. Any, anything that spins out and microtransactions and requires a, a, a authentication and verification along the way, uh, we operate very closely to that already. So we can quite easily move along these, these verticals. What are you working on right now? Well, right now, like I said, it's, 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 it is about the marketplace today. Um, so we're, we're focusing on making sure that it's easier, it's more accessible for non-BSV users. So that's the, next, that's the next month or two on the roadmap. Uh, and then moving on beyond that, uh, moving through data storage would, would likely be a first step. So we've, we've already created a, a fair bit of user, user verification, user sort of feedback on that uh, and gathered quite a bit of information for us to begin an, an MVP on that product so we can start some sort of feedback loop on that. Very cool. And you, uh, you did a deal with Tal earlier this year, I think um, mid this year. <laughs> I can't keep track of time anymore. Yeah. But, uh, so Tal was actually mid last year. Was that right? Oh, it was last year. Investment in Tal. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, a whole yeah, year off. Right. <laughs> well, how yeah, did that? Um, so they they we met Tal uh, for the first time in London, CoinGeek London, in 2020, mm -hmm. February 2020, I think. Uh, and since then, for for several months, we were just in discussions. You know, they were keeping up to date with what we we're doing, with our vision, our plans. Uh, as well as what we were building. Uh, and then in the end, in July 2020, we came to an investment deal with Tal uh, that obviously allowed Tal uh, a share purchase in our company. And then we were, we were also able to work closely with Tal in, um, in, our, in both their product suite and our product suite moving forward, uh, which is a really powerful relationship that I think benefits both sides uh, quite a lot. And uh, it, it has so far, and it will continue to be more apparent in the, in the coming months, uh, how our synergy works. Excellent. Do you keep in pretty close touch with them? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm uh, I'm in touch with the product development team almost every week, uh, and and wow. we're 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 working quite closely on some future some future products. All right. Uh, can you give us a teaser on what those future products are? Well, like I said, they're. I mean, Tal. The things you mentioned already. A, or? a lot of the payment infrastructure on on BSV in general. So. Right. We work quite closely with them, uh, even even in terms of like, as I mentioned, the data storage and Internet of Things products in the future. Uh, there's a lot of sort of ideas thrown back and forth, and 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 different synergies on how we're planning on managing the integrations of of these products uh, uh, for our own customer bases. So, it will be very interesting to see in the in the next few months uh, how that how that evolves. Right, right. Yeah, it just occurred to me it was a 2019 that the Soul Conference happened in the hackathons. <laughs> In that period, I think I somehow lost a whole year without even noticing it. <laughs> I think we all did. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what's your opinion of the BSV ecosystem in general? Is it uh, is it growing as fast as you'd like to see, or as fast as you had expected, or is it uh, you know lagging a little bit? There's sort of sentiments in both directions that I've seen. Yeah. No. It's 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 a good question. Um, is it obviously is it growing as fast as I like? No, right? Because yeah, because never would, is. Or, it could be growing ludicrously fast, and it would still not be as fast as I like, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would want it to be growing um, exponentially today or yesterday. Uh, but is it growing as fast as I expect? Uh, I'm not sure. It's it, there is a lot of friction, as as we know in the BSV community, uh, especially around sort of marketing and branding of BSV. We know we know that there's difficulties there. We know that there's friction there. Um, and I think it's you know all of our jobs as as app developers individually to to go out and and change that uh, as well as 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 well as uh, you know marketing people and and writers and and when it comes to Bitcoin Association, it's all of our jobs to to try our best to to build the best products and attract the most users to our products, uh, so that so that that changes and the growth accelerates. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is it growing as fast as I like? No, uh, but who can change that? Me, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, at least we can say it is growing. If you're if you're in BTC, yeah. you get to sit there and look at the price charts all day. But the, I I don't feel that the BTC economy is growing. You yeah, can... yeah, I, yeah. I think you're right. I think focusing too much on price is certainly uh, is certainly not a, a good way to approach it. Right? It's because because looking at BSV or any crypto as an, solely an investment means yeah. that it, inher it inherently doesn't work. Right. You can look at it as an investment if you also look at it as a powerful payment transaction processing system. 
then obviously there's a reason there's a ut- there's a utility behind it that will result in it being a good investment one day um, but if it's just a good investment and it does nothing else <laughs> then then it's not a good investment is 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 the way i see it exactly yeah all right, Shashank, thank you very much for coming on. Um, can you tell people where they can find out more about Takoda and what they can do with it? Certainly. Um, you can hop onto our website. Uh, there are details there already, and there will be more details to come over the couple of weeks where we're constantly building out uh, our documentation and our information about uh, our platform and our product. Uh, and certainly you can hop onto live chat on our website uh, and, and, and talk to us to, to get any details or, or questions answered that you need. It is very live chat too. It's been flashing at me. You have one new message, one new message. Every time I open up <laughs> it the really page. gets in your face. <laughs> <laughs> is there an actual human monitoring that chat? Yep. Right, right. <laughs> I, I never really know with those things. I sometimes feel it's not. Yeah, no, often, often it's it's myself or my co-founder or, or, or others as well who, who monitor that chat and we'll get back to you uh, with any questions you have. Very cool. All right. Check out uh, Coda.com uh, at Coda on Twitter, I think it is too. Yes, you, that's right. At Coda that that well. unique spelling really helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Hopefully you've got it, the title of the video. So. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so I do. I have to deal with that. Loud and clear. All right, Shashank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, John.